Welcome <laughs> in the spooky new year. I'm Megan. I'm Ella. And this is Modern Medieval the Podcast. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, everybody. So based on our opening, we are a bit spooky today. We wanted to kind of rein in the, uh, I mean, it's a bit more, I think, like Victorian tradition, though, of ghost stories during the holiday season and new year Mm -hmm. and so we thought oh let's share some medieval spooky stories some ghost stories and so I picked up or like discovered um, a collection by Andrew Joins called medieval ghost stories that is a compilation of ghost stories throughout different compendia Mm -hmm. and they're quite short and so Ella and I thought that you know we'd share a few with you yeah that you're reading on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Ella, why don't you start us off with your selection? Yes. So, I chose The Bath Keeper. Mm-hmm. So, I'll read it out for you guys. Bishop Felix passed on a story which was told to him by a virtuous priest who died two years ago. Before this, his death was pastor of the Church of St. John in the place called Tauriana. The priest told him that he often used to go and wash his body in a certain place where there were hot waters. On one occasion, he met, he met there a man whom he did not know who was ready to do him service. That is, to help him pull off his shoes, hold his clothes, and to attend upon him in all dutiful manner. And when he had done this a number of times, the priest began to wonder how he might show his gratitude for such a service by taking a present to the man. So he took with him two Eucharistic loaves, and when he arrived, he found the man waiting and accepted his help as usual. When he had washed himself, put on his clothes, and was ready to depart, the priest offered the holy reward which he had brought, desiring the man to take in all all goodwill the the present which he had charitably brought but then with a sad countenance the man said to the priest why did you give me these father this is holy bread and I cannot eat it for I whom you see here was once the overseer of these baths and I'm now after my death appointed for my sins to this place but if you wish to please me offer this bread unto almighty God and be an intercessor for my sins and by this shall you know that your prayers have been heard. If when you come again, you find me not here. And as he was speaking, he suddenly vanished, so that although he had previously seemed to be a man, he showed by his manner of departure that he was a spirit. All the following week, the good priest prayed fervently for him and daily offered up the holy sacrifice which the man had requested. Afterwards, returning to the baths, he found that he was no longer there. From this, we can see what great profit the souls of the deceased received by the sacrifice of the holy oblation. Oblation, sorry. Seeing the spirits of those that are dead desire it of this living, and even give certain tokens to let us understand how, in this way, they have received absolution. Mm. And that's adapted from the translations of the dialogues of Saint Gregory, who is Gregory the Great, Pope from 590 to 604. Yeah, if you just wanted to look that up, that's mm-hmm. where you could find that. And Elo, you ha- do you want me to read a story? Or do you want to do your next story? Go ahead and read yours. Okay. Um, so I'm pulling from a different part of the book. I'm going to be reading The Ghost in the Doorway, which is from the accounts of Hrop's ghostly visitations in the Laxdo La Saga. Mm-hmm. I think it's um, Norwegian or something of that sort. Let's see. Oh, it's Icelandic. Apologies. And it was known, it tells the story of seven generations of settlers in Western Iceland known as the Salmon River Dale. So this is around, yeah, like 890 to 1031. So the ghost and the doorway. Olaf was considered the noblest of all of Hoskuld's sons. The first winter that he kept house at Hjardalholt, he had many servants and workmen and labor was divided amongst the farmhands. One look after the dry cattle and oxen and another after the cows. The cattle fold was out in the wood, some way from the homestead. One evening, the man who looked after the dry cattle came to Olaf and asked him to make some other man look after them and to set apart for him some other work. Olaf answered, 
I wish you to go on with this same work of yours. The man said he would sooner go away. Then you think there is something wrong, said Olaf. I will go to this evening with you when you attend the cattle. And if I think there is any excuse for you in this, I will say nothing about it. But otherwise you will find your lot has taken a turn for the worse. Olaf took his gold set spear, the king's gift in his hand and left home with the farm hand. There was some snow on the ground. They came to the cattle fold, which was open and Olaf bade the man go in. I will drive up the cattle and you tie them up as they come in. The farmhand went to the fold door and then all unawares, Olaf finds him leaping into his open arms. When Olaf asked him why he was so terrified, the laborer replied, Prop stands in the doorway of the fold and reached out for me, but I have had my fill of wrestling with him. Olaf went to the fold door and struck at the ghost with his spear. Prop took the socket of the spear in both hands and wrenched it aside so that the spear shaft was broken. Olaf was about to run at Hrop, but he disappeared just where he stood, and there they parted, Olaf having the shaft and Hrop the spearhead. After that, Olaf and the farmhand tied up the cattle and went home, with Olaf now aware that the man was not to blame for his grumbling. The next morning, Olaf went to where Hrop was buried and had him dug up. Hrop was found undecayed, and there Olaf also found his spearhead. After that, he had a pyre made and Hrop burnt on it, and his ashes were flung out to sea. After that, no one had any more trouble with Hrop's ghost. And that's part of the revenant tradition, which we can talk about in a future um, episode, but the undecayed body and kind of apparitional reappearance. So, yeah. Fun. Fun, fun, fun. Right, so my one is the White Lady of Stamheim, I think it's pronounced. Okay. It's in Book 11, Chapter 113. So it's quite a short one. In the manner of Stamheim, the diocese of Cologne. Oh, one sec, sorry, really quick. Um, do you have, like, the historic bit of where that's from? No. I will just give you a really, really quick little bio, brief thing so you know where it comes from, and then I'll have you go. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, Ella's going to do the um, White Lady of Stamheim. Stamhain, Stamhain. Um, and just quickly, if you wanted to look into it, it's from uh, the Dialogue on Miracles of Caesarius of Heisterbach, also known as a Dialogus Miraculorum. And it was written in the late 12th to early 13th century. Yeah. So here we go. <laughs> in the manor of Stamhain in the Diocese of Cologne, there were two knights, Gunther and Hugo. One night when Gunther was away from his home, a maid took his sons, whom she was about to put to bed, into the courtyard that satisfy, to satisfy the needs of nature. As she stood with them, they saw a woman in a white dress with a pale face looking straight at them from beyond the enclosure. This alarming shape said nothing, but inspired fear in the maid because of her appearance. Then the creature went over to Hugo's land, which lay next door, looked over the fence in the same way, and then went back to the graveyard from which it had come. A few days later, Gunther's elder child fell sick and said, in seven days I shall be dead, and seven days after that my sister will die, and then a week later my younger sister will be dead too. And this is how it turned out. Moreover, after the deaths of the children, the mother and the maid both died, while at the same time Hugo the knight and his son perished also. These facts were witnessed by our prior Gerlach. Sad. So Quite much spooky. death. Yeah. yeah. Um... And I have just two other really short stories from the same collection. So Cesarius of Heisterbach, because um, it's a really fun collection of just these small vignettes that are really dark and morbid and spooky. Um, so quite interesting to be written by, you know, someone of the Cistercian Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the next one is that I'll be reading is The Spectral Warning, and it's from Book 11, Chapter 64, I believe. That's what LXIV means. So it's right after the one Elo read, which was of the same book, but Chapter LXIII. So 53? Is that right? 63? Yeah. yeah. All right. The Spectral Warning. The same kind of thing happened in the churchyard at Vaughan. After Vespers had been sung one evening, 
The scholars were playing in the twilight in the cloisters when they saw a human shape leave one of the graves where the canons used to be buried. After walking about the churchyard and crossing some of the graves, it descended into another tomb. A short while later, a canon died in that church and was put into the very grave which the creature had entered. This vision was witnessed by one of our monks, Christian Obon. Through visions of this kind, the future can sometimes be predicted. Ooh. Um, so yeah, yeah, just fun because as yours as well, just the fact that first story account, personal accounts, right? Someone that they knew saw this, someone at the, the yeah. face. Um, and the last one, just to kind of keep the spookiness from um, Cesarius of Heisterbach is uh, also because it's about a potion, you know, so you get a little bit of kind of mystery with that is from book 12, chapter XLI, so 61, and it's titled The Brimstone Potion. A knight called Rudinger from the Diocese of Cologne was so taken up with wine bibbing that he used to go to consecrations at manors throughout the diocese just so that he could quaff a good vintage. When he fell ill and was on the brink of death, his daughter asked him to come back and see her within 30 days. He replied, I will do this if I can. After his death, he did indeed make an appearance to his daughter and said, I have returned as you asked. In his hand, he was carrying a little pottery mug like the one he used to drink from in taverns. His daughter asked, Father, what is in that mug? And he replied, my tipple, which is brewed from sulfur and brimstone. I am always sipping from it, but I can never drain it completely. Then, as he disappeared, the girl understood, as much from his previous life as from his punishment, that there was little hope of his being saved. For in this life, wine is sweet to sip, but eventually it carries the poison of a viper. Brutal. Very brutal, but just like a fun little one. And also uh, a bit spooky for those of us who have participated in significant and ample tipple drinking ourselves <laughs> this holiday yeah. season. Exactly. So yeah, hopefully you enjoyed our little uh, ghost story, short story sharing. Yeah. Have and a good beginning of the year again. Yeah. Happy. We will see you soon. Yeah. So until next time, I'm Megan. And I'm Ello. And this is Modern Medieval Podcast. Do, 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 do.